The whole point of decentralization is that there is no single point of failure, no single point of control, uh, no single throat to choke. But decentralization can be messy. Yet somehow, Bitcoin nodes all over the world reach consensus every 10 minutes. Here to tell us what decentralization in action looks like is Bitcoin core developer Amiti Utarwar. Please give Amiti a very warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Amiti, and I'm here to talk to you about decentralization in action. So a little bit about me, I am a Bitcoin Core contributor, which means I write code for the open source client that lets people all over the world run Bitcoin. I was the first female contributor, and I focus on the peer-to-peer -peer network. My contributions have landed me on Forbes 30 Under 30, Coindesk Most Influential, and I'm generally around the space in articles, podcasts, etc. But enough about me, let's get to the good stuff. So, quick raise of hands. Who here is familiar with this concept of decentralization? Oh yeah, thank you for indulging me. This was just a quick participation check because I'd be impressed if you made it around a Bitcoin conference without grappling with this concept. And the word seems to contain it all. You take something centralized and then you don't do that. How complicated could it be? So, Let's hit that magic decentralization button, and you might get something that looks like this. This is a representation of computers around the world running Bitcoin software. And it looks pretty good, right? Messages are being passed through one another. There's a network that spans the entire world. That's pretty cool. But if you take a closer look at this image, you can see that if something happens to this node over here, well, then you've just kind of stranded Australia. And let's say this connection gets taken down. Now the hemispheres are split. One more node, we can split up the Americas, and boom, we have four separate networks going on. In ordinary software projects, we have a lot of ways to handle this. For example, just take some downtime until you can repair the connection. But in Bitcoin, first off, we don't take downtime. But more importantly, this is what we use decentralization for. We use it to avoid single points of failure. And that's really important because Bitcoin is a global money. And in order to achieve that, it needs to be censorship resistant, which means no entity should be able to prevent another entity from participating. Whether that's inadvertent, your node accidentally goes down and now you've cut off your friends, or if it's malicious, it's really important for us to be able to build this truly global money for there to not have that single point of failure. And so decentralization is really a tool to achieve this end. So we might have a network graph that looks something like this, which is going to be a lot more resilient. The main thing I'd like to point out here is that there's a lot more connections. So each node has to do more work. They have to send more messages and validate more information and in order to build that redundancy which is something I'm gonna call strong decentralization. So this is the kind of problem that I look at on a daily basis within the context of the code. A node on the Bitcoin network has to answer questions like, who should I connect to? How do I know if they're being malicious or honest? Am I re revealing private information? But how do I make sure my transactions get to the network without revealing that they are mine? And these are really hard problems. But for the most part, they're achievable. And the main reason for this is because computers can handle scale really well. This is a video that's showing blocks being propagated to nodes all around the world. And it's kind of incredible that a whole block worth of information can make it to computers across the entire planet in less than five seconds. A quick note is that this is a video from 2020, and so I hope that the geographic distribution that we see today would be a little bit different, but that just goes to show there are many, many ways in which we need to continue working on decentralizing. 
So solving the double spend problem in a decentralized way was the core innovation of the Bitcoin white paper. From day one that Satoshi released the clients and the white paper, there was this innovative solution of how mining or the leader election could be done at random in a way that rotated. And how nodes for themselves could verify all of that information and say, okay, who has how much money and can I validate that myself? But building Bitcoin in a decentralized way, well, that's still an ongoing problem. And it's a really, really hard one. It's challenging enough to get tens of thousands of nodes to agree on what happened when, but it's arguably even more difficult to get thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to agree on what should we do next or how should we do it. And it can be kind of overwhelming. The vast majority of social systems that we see in this day and age are extremely centralized for this reason. Because as you saw with that strong decentralization model, there's a lot of redundancy and it can be perceived as waste when you're using decentralization. Imagine trying to get a group of 10 people to agree to something and then scale that to 100 and then 1,000 and 100,000. It feels impossible. Do you think you can get 100,000 people to agree to absolutely anything? And so on the question of how we can do that, we can look to models around the world to give us some inspiration. So we'll start with ants. Ants have a really interesting way of discovering food. When they're first scouting for food, they'll take a random pattern and go in different directions. And when they find a tasty morsel, they'll take the most direct path back to their home base and release pheromones that are proportional to the size of feast that they have discovered. And so then with that signal of scent, other ants will converge and go to that same feast, make the same route back, and eventually they can form this neat little line that might be leading straight to the leftovers you forgot about. It's quite an incredible idea that the in signals of the individual can influence the collective as a whole to organize so neatly. Bees offer another example of consensus through the individuals. Every year, they need to find a new place to live. They can't break up the clan because there's only one queen. And so they also can't have one person go scout all of the locations. And so they use decentralized consensus. The way it works is they send out their scouts, they find viable places to live, and then they come back and they do what's called a waggle dance to demonstrate how appropriate the new place that they found is to live. And it's pretty funny because if there's any contention, they literally have a dance off <laughs> and will be trying to garner uh, agreement within the collective by the size of their actions, demonstrating how appropriate this new place would be for them to live. So this way they are able to eventually resolve their conflict and use this decentralized consensus machine to decide where should we move to. But it's not just animals. Although the vast majority of our social systems, whether it's government, money, schools, banks, internet, blah, 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 are centralized, we do have some models we can look to in our human collective that are decentralized and very effective. Specifically, I'm talking about language. So here I have some words, some of which have come into our collective knowledge through internet and meme culture, and others which are deemed words by Webster's Dictionary. Let me take a shot at which ones you'd understand if I were to use in casual conversation. And let me focus on the HODL example. It started with one person on one forum writing one message, and now has become a word that you probably are all familiar with and has propagated through our entire community. It's quite incredible how the actions of an individual can impact the whole, and that's the entire idea of decentralization. So coming back to the question of how do we make Bitcoin better? If you believe in decentralization, that means that you believe 
your participation matters. The signals that you send out as an individual have the ability to influence the whole collective. So now I'm gonna do a real poll. Um, who here runs a full node? Yeah, that's awesome. Who here uses Bitcoin on a non-custodial wallet? All right, nice. And who here is on Bitcoin Twitter? Okay, cool. So if you believe that your participation matters, the next question is, how do you participate well? And this is not, oops, I'm sorry. Okay, and there's some good advice for that. One is don't trust, verify. You might have heard this concept, and it's really important. At the node level on the network, they need to validate each transaction to make sure that they hold the ledger. They have to verify the blocks, and that's the way that the system is able to operate. This works at a human level, too, because if you trust someone else to hold your private keys, then if they do something with it, you might not actually have access to Bitcoin on the blockchain. However, on the other hand, 100% trustlessness is impossible. You can't audit every single piece of hardware and software that it requires to run a singular node, let alone all of the other layers of community that is required in order for Bitcoin to succeed in our human world. And so we have to hold these things and decide, how do I spend my time at an individual level? And there are so many options. This is just a small snippet of things that you could do to participate in the community. And this doesn't even represent the whole realm of options. So I think what it really comes down to is intentionality. You have to be intentional about what you consume and what you create. Because what you consume is the equivalent of a node validating transactions on the blockchain. That's how you absorb the material of where the community at, is at, what is the truth of the current state of affairs, and what is that shared state. But you also have to make sure to create and not get stuck in that consumption mode. Because that's the equivalent of mining a block or broadcasting a transaction. That's what makes money move on the Bitcoin blockchain, but that's also what makes our social system move on the human level. So if there's one thing that you can take away from this talk, it's this. If you believe in decentralization, then your actions matter. Think skeptically and build things. Whether that's a conversation with people you care about at dinner, or it's educational material or writing code, find what works for you and go hard at it. Thank you very much. If you're interested in um, more visual fun material that covers technical concepts, then we're launching this project called the Bitcoin Bytes. You can sign up for our mailing list at this website or find us on Twitter. Also, those of you who are able to find me, we have some cute little physical zines. Uh, this one's explaining Taproot at a high level. Um, so I'll be distributing this or those over the course of this conference. And if you're interested in getting a hold of me, this is my email, or you can find me on Twitter. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're here at the Bitcoin Magazine live desk presented by Marathon at Bitcoin 2023. Joined by a new round of special guests. To my left, Amanda Cavallari, chair of the Bitcoin Today Coalition. To her left, Marty Bent, host of the Truth for the Commoner podcast. And last but not least, joining Shaktel, independent investigative journalist. We just heard from Amiti Uttarwar, a Bitcoin core developer, talking about decentralization in a technical manner. I want to bring that back for the viewers at home and talk about how decentralization relates to the collapse and trust that we're seeing, especially as we hear from more political figures later, Amanda. I think for you know our entire lives, for millennia, these power entities have become more and more centralized. So there's fewer and fewer people at the top making these decisions. And I think now that we have a distribution of information and money, that is changing. And we're seeing these grassroots, you know, ground level up things through tools like Bitcoin. A change from top down to bottom up, maybe. Marty, your take. 
Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin provides us with that tool that allows us to not have to trust the centralized authorities. I mean, that's what Bitcoin said. Uh, excuse me, not Bitcoin, said what Satoshi said uh, on the mailing list many times. Banks can't be trusted. Trusted third parties will continually corrupt the systems they control. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin, as Media explained. The distribution of the node topography, hash rate, makes it so no individual or small group of individuals can control Bitcoin. That's very powerful. Jordan, uh, your take, an investigative uh, journalist, maybe here a bit skeptically, your second conference. What is your take on this decentralization, centralization dynamic and Bitcoin's role? Yeah, it's fascinating because I was just this morning writing about the Bilderberg Conference, which is the meeting <laughs> of the elite of the elites, you know, this, these 150 people that are basically, um, you know, some of the most powerful people in the world who all believe in this globalist centralized ideology. And to see that in contrast with the Bitcoin Conference is, is pretty unbelievable. You have a lot of people here who just believe in freedom and that Bitcoin is basically the best tool to defend their freedoms both you know, for Americans that are here and everyone globally. It's, it's, it's an incredible uh, grassroots movement, for sure. Well, Bitcoin and freedom, a hot topic. We heard present presumptive Republican hopeful Ron DeSantis recently come out against a central bank digital currency. Let's talk about the dyna dynamic of the federal government trying to exercise more authority. Maybe a digital dollar coming. Marty, Amanda, your take? Uh, that would be a slave coin uh, that I don't want, <laughs> that nobody would want. Mm. They'd be able to track you, tell you where you can spend, what you can spend on. Uh, and the bubbling theme and trend of governments talking about CBDC signals to me that they're worried they're losing control <clears throat> of the current monetary system and the financial system, and they need to thrust the CBDC to maintain that control, and that's why it's extremely important that Bitcoin succeeds. Amanda, your take, what can we do about this digital dollar coming? I think what we can do is push back at a state level right now. So that's huge, right? What Florida's just done. You know, we look at also these examples of, of what's going on with China. There's massive debt around the world. China's got a lot of, you know, folks that owe them money. So I think we'll see this this turn of like, okay, a lot of folks um, where they have helped build ports and things will forgive your debt, use our mm. use our digital yuan, right. Right? right? So I think we're going to see that trend grow and grow, especially in Africa and in South America. Some insidious tactics. Jordan, uh, CBDCs versus the digital dollar versus Bitcoin? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the politicians who are standing up for our rights, um, whether that's, you know, Ron DeSantis in, this, in the free state of Florida. I think one of the reasons why we have the Bitcoin conference here is because other states basically it wouldn't allow only, it. Yeah, and during the right? pandemic, fun fact. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's very interesting to see that there's this new kind of political divide in the United States. You have like statists versus freedom advocates. So, you know, we have a Democrat, RFK Jr. here. We have Tulsi Gabbard here. We have Cynthia Lummis here. It's very interesting to see this new coalition mm. arise.